Good morning. I wrote a ghost play once called Genevieve Stickney's Ghost in the year of 2013. Apparently, there is a ghost named Jeffany Stickney who hanged herself with in her home elevator back in the 1940s and later on then her home turned into the Bowers Harbor Inn and it became a culture visit and some say that they saw Genevieve Stickney's ghost so I wrote the play and finished it and later on I found out that Jeveny Stickney's never hung herself, but she had died at the Pandolin Hotel in 1947 in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Well, I still have my play script, and I changed the title saying, Reflections of a Mistress. The three principal actresses is Genevieve Stickney, Frances Wellington, and Mary Beth Hazelworth. And later on I found out the very true mistress in this story in Traverse City, Michigan in 2013. Act 1, Scene 6. Mrs. Genevieve Stickney steps from the elevator into the foyer, crossing to Charles. She gives a darting stare of repulsion at Mary Beth, and then quickly and sternly confronts Charles. I would like to have a word with you in the den, if you don't mind. Genevieve crosses the stage, miming opening two sliding den doors, and enters as Charles follows behind, shutting the doors behind them. I would like to have a word with you in the den, if you don't mind. Now, Genevieve, please remain calm and listen to me. No, you're the one who's going to be doing all the listening, Charles. How dare you send me a telegram informing me of your new acquisition without my approval? What possessed you to travel to the East Coast when there are ample number of qualified applicants locally and sufficiently capable of serving my needs? Apparently, we've forgotten my informing you, my dear friend, Eugene Debs. I clearly outlined my intentions of traveling to his home in Terre Haute, Indiana, and then continuing onward to New York, where other important business matters awaited me. I heard no such thing as for Eugene. He's a pompous blunderass. Why in God's name are you conversing with that malicious criminal in the first place? He's hardly a criminal, Genevieve. The man has been a presidential candidate several times in recent years, and his only assumed crime is speaking out against that damn European war we just fought. He's been a good friend for many years, and I won't allow you bullying him. Do you understand me? Now get a hold of yourself and let's calmly discuss this matter at a later time. All lies. I refuse to believe anything you say. When are you going to stop with your filthy lies? I know exactly what your motivations were going to New York. And don't contradict me when I say it was selfishly convenient for you to hire that young hussy, making it considerably difficult for me in releasing her from her station. That's not true. And if you'll allow me to explain my intentions... You needn't explain anything further, for your actions speak loudly. How clearly you have chosen another naive young girl to hold on to your, to your arm sleeves, who will happily be led by your sugary-coated nonsense. We've been here many times before, Charles, and my patience can only handle so much of your malicious betrayals. Once more, Genevieve, that is not true. 
you have recklessly discharged several nurses within the last year, professing their in inefficiencies without any substantial proof. Your questionable behavior will not be permitted any longer. The young lady standing outside this room is a certified nurse with years of experience that I have closely verified. I will not allow you to disgrace this household by displaying any indignant or hateful actions against her. Do I have your promise on this? How dare you judge me? You think I don't know why you travel to the four corners of the world without me? I'm not entirely oblivious to your roving eyes, for I've been silent spectator of your adulterous romps for too many years now. I will not allow you to humiliate me any more, Charles, by parading your prissily skirted tulips underneath my nose. Do you hear me, Charles? Yes, I do, and I also realize we're not getting anywhere with this discussion. We've covered this ground many times before. I suggest you return to your room and allow me to show our new guest her accommodations. It is late, and we are understandably tired after a long journey. Now please listen to reason and introduce yourself to your new nurse. Her name is Mary Beth Hazelworth, and I'm confident you will find her pleasant and diligent in her duties. If it's any consolation, I did miss you, Genevieve, for your welfare is always greatly important to me. One other small matter you need to hear. If you ever leave me alone in the company of Breda Hensling again when you're away, I will not be responsible for my actions. She's an absolutely atrocious individual, short on manners, and lacking great finesse. I'd rather be left alone dying than be smothered by her awkwardness. And before I forget, I strongly believe she's stealing my underwear and pillaging food from our kitchen. Nothing more I can stand is another sneaky thief. Be a good girl now and greet our guest. I'll let you know in a few days whether she meets my standards. I'm sure you will. As Genevieve turns to exit, Mary Beth hurriedly returns to the luggage. Genevieve opens the sliding doors, moving toward her. Hello, I'm Genevieve Stickney. How was your trip? She stretches out her hand to Mary Beth. It was tiresome, but lovely. I'm so glad you've arrived. It's quite late, so I'll leave you in Charles' trusty hands, showing you to your quarters. I look forward to the morning, when we can begin to get to know one another. Won't that be nice? Good night. Yes, it will. Good night. Genevieve goes to the elevator, exiting, as Charles moves to Mary Beth. Is she always like this? As I've already lengthily explained, unfortunately, yes. Mary Beth embraces Charles to his surprise. In the coming days, I'll need your support. Yes, my dear. You needn't worry. I'll always be here for you. The light slowly dimmed to black as Francis speaks. We stood there, embracing in the middle of the night, and then Charles picked up our luggage, leading me to my room. And that is how I first met Genevieve Stickney. Well, we're finally here. <laughs> it was a struggle, but we got you home. Let's get to you over to your chair. That's right. Keep your foot up off the floor. Now turn around and sit down while I roll your pant leg up. That's good. Is it feeling any better? No, it's actually getting worse. Well, don't get up. I'm going to get some hot water for that ankle of yours. She exits the room. Uh, I've always hated pain. 
As a, as a young brat, I, I fell off my bicycle and my mother heard me cry and <laughs> she, she walked up to me saying, after you get your fill of crying, try standing up and brushing the dirt off for crying only a damn waste of time. <laughs> she always knew what I needed. She reappears carrying a bowl of hot water in one hand and a bottle of whiskey in the other with a white cloth over her arm. Here, sip this. It will ease the throbbing. That's what I like. A nurse who properly medicates our patient. <laughs> Hanging around doctors after hours taught me a thing or two. This hot water may sting a bit, but it should alleviate your pain. She submerges his foot into the hot water and gently massages his foot and ankle. Ah, oh, that feels good. How does it taste? Warm and smooth. I think I'm feeling better already. <laughs> hey, uh, before I forget, the story you just told, was she mentally ill or was it just her irrational personality? Oh, I, I think a little bit of both contributed to her unfortunate condition. Charles told me he had her psychologically examined at the Northern Michigan Asylum. The doctors wanted her to remain there for you know, more observation, but as he looked around at its dismal corridors and, and hearing hysterical screams echoing from behind its whitened walls, he couldn't bring himself to leave her there. He promised himself never to consider such a terrifying option again, knowing full well that as difficult as it would become, her place was there under his care. I never doubted his love for her. I have another uh, question. That's uh, been bugging me. How, how did you become Mrs. Wellington? As she answers his question, her massaging his foot grows increasingly more seductive. Hmm, that's an interesting chapter in my multifarious life. It started with an ocean cruise on the SS Normandy in 1936 to France. My heart was set on a trip to Lorraine in the quaint city of St. Michel. It was there that I finally made peace with my loss of Ronnie. And that was while walking over the sodden earth that once swallowed him up 18 years before. It was a crystal clear morning and the sun was shining brightly over the killing fields, which were now covered with yellow wildflowers as far as the eye could see. I forced myself to look up and imagine him him falling, helplessly falling downward from its bluish skies. My only thought as I turned to leave was the senselessness of it all, of why young men had to fight and die there, leaving countless broken hearts forever questioning. Then, out of nowhere, a roguish gust of wind suddenly set my hat in the flight to my amazement. A handsome young man in a dark suit went running over to it and brought it safely back to me. And we shared a laugh or two, smiling all the while, with his bluish eyes warming up to me as my lungs strained for life-giving breath. His name was Thomas Stuart Wellington, and he was 45 years old. We soon dined in Paris at the Brasserie Athene on the Avenue de la Champs-Élysées under multicolored lights. Cheerfully, we shared our past and, and I learned he lived in London, England now, off the Thames River, working for Alexander Corder in London Films as one of his film editors. Thomas and I had a lot in common, and later that night, before falling to sleep, I thanked dear Ronnie for bringing us together that windy day. I didn't return to America for within three months. We, we were married, and, 
And that, dear Brian, is how I came to be known as Mrs. Francis Wellington. They stare in each other's eyes. She draws closer to him, resting her chin squarely upon his bare knee while looking up at him as he affectionately places his hand atop her head. This tapelo holds true as the light slowly dim to black intermission. <laughs>